Good morning, congregation. On behalf of Council, we welcome you to Living Light Canadian Farm Church with a special welcome to our guests and visitors and all of you joining us by live stream. Council has the following announcements. Classes Niagara hopes to meet on September 13th. Our coffee social is planned for this afternoon, complete with cake to celebrate the anniversary, the 60th anniversary of brother and sister Bolche. Host family today will be Mike and Marlene de Borsap. Our pre-service song will be this morning, Psalm 57, stanzas 1, 5, and 6, from the supplement book in your pews on page 17. This morning we welcome Pastor Reverend and Holder to lead our worship service. Thank you. congregation. Out of reverence for the Lord, let's begin our worship together while standing. Our call to worship this morning, selected also in connection with the message later, is from Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. This is what the prophet Isaiah says as the mouthpiece of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We respond to this call in unison with the confession that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also his greeting, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's also join together in response to this greeting of our God with the words of Psalm 84, the stanzas 1, 5, and 6. Oh uh-huh. 
This morning again, we may listen to the reading of God's law. Last week, Sunday in the afternoon, we listened to the, an explanation of the first part of the fifth petition, forgive us our debts, and reflected there too on the wonder of God's grace that He would forgive us our debts. The way the Bible speaks of our debts as sin and iniquity and transgression, as David confessed that in Psalm 51. We also confess in the Catechism that daily we increase our debt. We're reminded of that every time we listen to God's law, how our debt increases. The Apostle Paul is speaking of that in Romans chapter 7. He wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But as it is, the very commandment that was intended to bring life brings death. As he sees this war being waged in his heart where he wants to do good and and yet evil is always there right with him. And the law confronts him with that. So that he cries out at the end of chapter 7, Wretched man that I am, who will, re- who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he comes to this glorious conclusion, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And then comes Romans chapter 8. There's perhaps almost no greater verse than this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so even though we listen to God's law and are confronted with our debt, every Sunday again we at the same time can say with David or with Paul, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we don't despair in listening to this law, but we are directed again to Christ. We get to sing together then from Psalm 103, of an incredible comfort of the forgiveness of our debts. We'll sing the stanzas 1, 3, and 5. Let's listen to God's law this morning with all that on our heart. Deuteronomy chapter 5, God said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And so when our Lord Jesus was asked which of these was the great commandment in the law, He replied with this summary, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so the Apostle Paul also concludes in Romans 13 that love is the fulfilling of the law.
Let's also together come to our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, what a way for us to be able to prepare our hearts for prayer. To receive again in this psalm the reassurance that as a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on those who fear you. That's what brings us into your presence this morning. Fear of you. Not a terror, trembling kind of fear, but an awe and reverence kind of fear. That we as broken sinners may yet come into your presence. Indeed, Father, your law does make us conscious of our sin. In light of your law, we, we know the truth of our confession that daily we increase our debt. The commandments, they expose us. We would not know fully what sin is unless your law had not cut us deeply. There is not a day that goes by that we are not cut by your word. You call us to have no other gods before you. We confess, we cannot hide it from you, that too often we are our own God. The self, that's our nature. We would rather trust ourselves, listen to ourselves, look at ourselves. We put ourselves in between you and us so that we we don't always see you for who you are. Forgive us, Father, when we have another God before you or even besides you. We confess that even our worship is too often self-willed worship. We want to worship you in a way that, that fits our patterns, our lifestyles, our desires rather than submitting to you and to your word. We know that we bear your name. Upon our baptism, you you put that water of baptism on our foreheads, baptizing us into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We confess ourselves to be Christian, taking on ourselves the name of Christ. That's not to be taken lightly. There too we confess that your name is not always honored and praised because of us, but at times even blasphemed. It hurts, Father, to acknowledge these things. We could go through each one of the commandments and see how they expose us and lay that before you. It's with broken and contrite hearts that we confess our sin to you this morning, our debt. We owe you. We owe you a significant and incalculable debt. Forgive us, Father, as you have promised in the blood of your Son. Wash us as you have signified and sealed to us in our baptism. Cleanse us of our iniquities and transgressions. Make us new again by the power of Your Spirit. Indeed, Father, in making us new, use Your Word as that's open again this morning. That as You have forgiven us our debts, we might also see evidence of Your grace in us that we are also wholeheartedly determined to forgive our debtors. Prepare our hearts to receive that teaching of our Savior that we may reflect You in, in all that we do, that we may become more and more the image of Christ as we also forgive our debtors. And Father, do that by Your Spirit, that we may be made whole again, that we may be made new, changed into Your likeness, transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Hear us in Jesus' name alone. Amen.
as I suggested last week already in the afternoon, it was a message to be continued as we looked at the first part of that petition, forgive us our debts, and the Lord willing, uh, we would this morning continue with that as we have also forgiven our debtors. I'd like to read with you from the Word of God in the Gospel account of Mark and then Luke, and then we're going to jump all the way back to the beginning. I know that's not the way it appears in the Bible, of course. But first, we'll listen to the teaching of our Savior in Mark 11 and Luke 17, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 50, where is a beautiful account of Joseph forgiving his brothers. So we read the teaching of Christ, and then also where God gives us an illustration of His teaching in Genesis 50. First of all, then, Mark 11, verse 20 through 25, and it's especially verse 25 that comes to bear on Jesus' teaching in this petition. Mark 11, verse 20 to 25, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. That's the fig tree that Jesus had cursed earlier in the chapter. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. That's from the Gospel according to Mark, then also Luke chapter 17. Jesus has another word of teaching regarding forgiveness. We'll read verses 1 through 6, Luke 17 verses 1 through 6. And he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Jesus teaching on forgiveness. There is more. Those are the selections for this morning, then we also turn to Genesis chapter 50. This comes at the, nearly at the end of the account of Joseph. For those of you who are familiar with the story, or perhaps unfamiliar, I should say, with the story, Joseph has long ago been sold into slavery after being thrown into the pit, been sold into slavery by his brothers, where he has spent time in prison after false accusation, where he has at the same time experienced the hand of God in bringing him to be the second highest ruler in the land. Then his brothers come and they are fearful that Joseph would repay them for what they had done to him earlier in life. They are fearful of that already while their father was alive and then when their father dies, they are again increasingly fearful. This is how the story then concludes between Joseph and his brothers, Genesis 50 verse 15 and following. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, 
I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So far, the reading. When Joseph says, do not fear for am I in the place of God, he is acknowledging that God alone is judge. Let's also sing about that from Psalm 94. It's not a psalm that we sing very often, but the psalmist there does sing and confess of how God is the righteous judge who alone is to stand in vengeance. Lord, or Psalm 94, we'll sing the stanzas 1 and 7. Usually we have our catechism sermon in the afternoon, but because we have a guest minister this afternoon and he would like to continue his series on First Peter, I thought we would continue with the catechism this morning. And so Lord's Day 51 is in front of us. As I said, Lord's Day 51, I'm going to zero in on the second part of the petition, but once again, we'll just read the entire question and answer. I'll ask the question and invite you to recite the answer together. What is the fifth petition? And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us, wretched sinners, any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us. As we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. As our amen to that, we'll sing together the words of the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I'll offer a little disclaimer before we start. There is no way that, in some sense, you could do justice to the topic of forgiveness in a half an hour message. Beautiful books have been written, as you'll also hear in the message. Uh, This is to be an encouragement to think on it further and to continue in God's grace as we grow in forgiveness. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, are there forgiven sinners in hell? Are there forgiven sinners 
in hell. Now that sounds probably like a provocative question. But the truth is, the way that forgiveness is sometimes taught today, that is the conclusion that we could come to. That hell is filled with forgiven sinners. It follows, we could say, when forgiveness is explained as little more than a matter of the heart, than a feeling. If it's just that in my own heart, is it just that in God's heart? Is that what the Bible teaches? Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 32, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So there is a connection between the way God forgives and the way we ought to forgive. Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. As I said last week, we heard about the first part. God's incredible grace of the forgiveness of our sins confirmed in baptism. What about the second part? As we also. Doesn't that give us pause for some introspection? Some self-examination? As we also. Am I ready to pray that to the Father? Forgive as I also forgive. What does that look like? So this morning I ask the question and hope that we come to some answers. Are you forgiving your debtors? Well, look in the first place inward and then outward, and then upward. Are you forgiving your debtors? First of all, looking inward. We read together from Luke chapter 17. In verse 3, Jesus offers a word about teaching, a word of teaching about rebuke and forgiveness when a sinner repents. We could say that moves our eyes already outward. But we have to notice what Jesus says right before He gives that instruction. He says, Pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. That teaches us to look inward first. What is the attitude of our hearts? The Catechism too uses that language this morning. As we also find this evidence of your grace in us that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. What's happening in the heart? We can already call forgiveness. For we also read Mark 11, that in verse 25, Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. If you're in the middle of prayer, and if you think of someone who has, whom, whom you have something against, Jesus says, forgive them. He doesn't say, stop there in the middle of your prayer, go to them, deal with whatever's between you, and then carry on with your prayer. No, here in Mark 11, he simply says, forgive them, right there. That tells us that forgiveness starts as a matter of the heart. Again, what does that look like? What should we find looking inward? Tim Keller, in his very helpful book on forgiveness, highlights three things. Identifying with the wrongdoer, inwardly paying the debt, and willing good for the wrongdoer. Identifying with the wrongdoer, inwardly paying the debt, and willing good for the wrongdoer. Identifying with the wrongdoer. In Mark, we find Jesus saying, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have, any, if, if you have anything against anyone. Anyone is still the neighbor. Jesus speaks of the neighbor we are called to love. Back to Luke 17, Jesus says, if your brother or your sister sins against you, there's still a brother or a sister 
that we are called to love. Point being, we are the same. Isn't that what stirred Joseph's heart in Genesis chapter 50 when he first saw his brothers? Not, oh, these are the guys that threw me into the pit and then sold me into slavery. No, my brothers, he sees them. Everything in the account up to what we read shows us that Joseph is, to use the words of the catechism, fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive his neighbor. But that's hard to hold on to, isn't it? When someone has wronged you. Maybe we begin to think that we would never do that ourselves. How could they? Or we begin to look at them only through the lens of what they did to us. Their sin begins to loom large in our minds. When people hurt us, it can cloud out anything else that we would think of them. If we don't remember who they are, neighbors to love, brothers and sisters in Christ to love, then quickly resentment settles in and bitterness or self-righteousness. Maybe you've been burnt by someone's gossip or a breach of confidence. You know the temptation to look on them, how could they, and to forget the many instances that you've gossiped. But when I identify with them as as fellow image bearers, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, all in need, like me, of forgiveness and the grace of God, Self-righteousness can be defeated. They need love. They need grace like I need love and I need grace. Then we're also better placed to pay the debt ourselves. That was the second. We heard it last week already. Forgiveness is about paying the debt. That's what the word forgive means. To remit something. To, to take on the cost. You're not making someone else pay. You end up paying the cost yourself. Maybe the boys and girls here this morning have experienced that, playing with a ball in the front yard and swinging the baseball bat and it accidentally goes to the neighbor's window. Sheepishly, we might have to go to the front door and admit what we did. But if your neighbor's very kind, he might say, Don't worry about it. It was an accident. But who has to pay for the window? He may have to. He bears the cost himself, and so it is with forgiveness. Jesus says, if you're praying and you have anything against anyone, forgive. Don't make them pay for what they've done to you. Refuse to think of revenge. Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil. That's hard, isn't it? We hear it often at home. But she, but he. Right? Why did you hit him? Because he. It's in our nature. We all do it. But forgiveness says, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to even things up. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth doesn't apply in this instance. Forgiveness in the heart means I'm not going to do to them what they did to me. It might take a long time for that cost to be paid off, but we're ready to bear it ourselves. Maybe it's far worse than a broken window that perhaps the neighbor could pay off in one installment. Maybe it's going to require a loan, a payment in installments, things that we break. Like when we bear the cost... That might be a high cost, and it might take years to pay off. Constant moments of telling ourselves, she's my sister, he's my brother, I'm not going to make them pay for what they've done to me. Even more than that, it's I want something better for them. Repay no one evil for evil, back to Romans 12, 17, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. 
That's the way of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. They've sinned, obviously. Otherwise, He wouldn't talk about forgiveness. But He's gracious toward them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, open their eyes to see the error of their ways and and bring them on the road to repentance. That'd be better for them. That's what He's saying in His prayer. Can you pray for the one who's wronged you? For their well-being? Not vengefully or spitefully. Can you stop hitting replay on the ways that you've been hurt and instead fast forward to a new and different place desiring better for them? That and more is what Jesus means when He says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone. The question is, is that all? Is that all there is to forgiveness? Looking inward. Clearly not, otherwise there wouldn't be more points to the sermon. But it's still a question worth asking. Why? Because as I highlighted already here in the introduction, more and more teaching on forgiveness actually stops there. It's just about feelings, internal feelings, how you feel towards the other. It fits in our culture, which is all about feelings and autonomy, and individualism. What matters is me, and how I'm doing. If I don't forgive, bitterness, and anger, and revenge will eat away at me. That's what matters, isn't it? First, my own health, and what a lack of forgiveness might do to my own well-being. Or is that all that matters? What happens then? Do we really desire the best for the other? And what happens to the way that we then think about God's forgiveness? Does God simply forgive no questions asked about what happens in the heart and life of the wrongdoer? Would that not mean that hell is full of forgiven sinners? Forgiven by a God who doesn't in love call people to repentance and change. Doesn't that cheapen what really happens? What grace we really enjoy when welcomed into a heavenly dwellings. Think about it. As one author explains, suppose two people stole money from you. Later, when they were caught, one was repentant and did his best to pay you back. On the other hand, the other person never experienced any regret over what he had done. In fact, you find out that he would often still brag about what he had done. Now, in both cases, it would be the responsibility of the Christian to offer grace. Christians are always willing to forgive. However, only the repentant offender would open the package, as it were, and be forgiven. To say that both are forgiven diminishes what happens with the person who is repentant and with whom the relationship is restored. You hear it there, don't you, beloved, that there's got to be more than just an internal feeling. Therapeutic forgiveness, as some call it. Forgiveness and reconciliation, they aren't exactly the same thing, but the aim of forgiveness is certainly reconciliation. Forgiveness inward is is like a package, a wrapped package, as it were, is how one author describes it, that you present to the wrongdoer. And then the intent is and the prayer is that they would open that package and enjoy full forgiveness. That means we're also outward looking. Our second point. We have to turn back to Luke chapter 17. Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins or your sister sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Jesus teaches that there is another aspect to this forgiveness. Rebuke and repentance. If he repents, forgive him. It's not always enough to say, well, I've forgiven them in my heart. Then sin 
might be left undealt with. Conflict can remain unresolved. Justice is not done. And relationships remain forever strained. Maybe unintentionally or without realizing it, but still. Oh, there is the text too about love covering over a multitude of sins. Discernment is necessary sometimes for love to say this one can be left alone, but not always. Just imagine too that God's grace of forgiveness would be like that. Then evil and wickedness would never be called out. Why should it? Forgiveness is free and full for all. But it's not like that. So Jesus says, rebuke. Or we might say, confront. Pursue justice. Aim to set things right. The question is, how? We reflected on that the last time we looked at Lord's Day 31. And then at that time we read from Matthew 18, verse 15 and following. If your brother sins against you, if your sister sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Go. That suggests don't waste any time. Don't wait for the right opportunity. Don't wait for it to just somehow come up in conversation. And certainly don't first talk about it with others. Go. Or be going, Jesus is saying. Do it promptly and do it repeatedly as necessary. It's not enough to say, well, I've said it once. Promptly, repeatedly, and purposefully. Go and tell him his fault. Yes, tell him with words. Not with silent treatment, not with avoidance, not with a cold shoulder, not with a cancel culture. Tell him or her what it is that has been done wrong that is between you. And privately, between you and him or her alone, with the assurance of this strict confidentiality, this is between us. Let that begin to create a safe space. You're interested in each other's well-being and the state of your relationship. We've identified with this wrongdoer. Remember, as we heard earlier, brothers and sisters, we have the best interest at heart, the eternal salvation of each other at heart, a right relationship again with God and with each other. Oh, we still go reluctantly, as it were. Proverbs 20, verse 3, it's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. We're not looking for strife. Strife that might come as a result of such a confrontation. We're not eager to point out someone else's fault. In fact, maybe it's the last thing we want to do. But we become more weighed by earnestness than eagerness. Reluctance. That can also say to the other, we're not coming here with wrong motives. And gentleness. Galatians 6, 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Not a sharp and heart, hurtful tongue. Perhaps direct as needed, but always the truth in love. That requires great care in our choice of words. The book of Proverbs is full of instructions, pithy sayings even, of how important is the choice of our words. Proverbs 12, 18, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Healing. That's what we're after. That's what forgiveness is. Healing that ever only comes by the grace of God, by the powerful working of the Spirit. Only He can bring the dead to life. Only He can bend the stubborn will and soften the hard heart. Only He can bring reconciliation and restoration to relationships that have been strained and broken by hurt and harm. And so more than anything else that I've mentioned so far, This loving rebuke is drenched in humble prayer. Prayer before, prayer during, prayer after. 
Loving confrontation and rebuke that brings healing is drenched in prayer. And then we do this with a sense of confidence. It can and it does bring healing. Because it's in the context of those instructions in Matthew 18 that Jesus says, Again, I say to you, if two or three are together in my name, sorry, if you, two of you agree on, on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Think on that. You and a brother or sister with hearts full of forgiveness, talking about sin, about fault, about the hurt in your relationship, and recognizing it together, bowing your heads in humble prayer, knowing that what you ask, it will be done. There is forgiveness. There can be reconciliation. And what an abundance that is. Superabundant grace for the humble and contrite heart. And if that's not enough, Jesus continues, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. That's what Jesus says. Think about that. Is loving rebuke something to be afraid of then? Something to be scared of? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Jesus gives the assurance of His gracious presence. You do this hard work with you. And we understand because He is there with us, forgiveness is possible. Forgiveness with reconciliation. Well, sadly, it doesn't always happen that way. Repentance doesn't always come. Then relationships might be forever under strain. But where there is, then forgiveness becomes a commitment not to bring the matter up again. Not to them, not to others, not to ourselves. It's over. Sometimes you hear the phrase, forgive and forget. If only it was that simple. Like you could flip a switch or just close a safe box or whatever. To just lock away our memory. Our memories don't work like that. There are some wrong things done to us that we just can't forget. Ever. At least, not remove from our memory bank. But we can prayerfully seek to forget it. To commit it to the past as forgiven and left behind. Never to replay that video of that wrong in our minds again. Never to talk about it with others. Never to suggest it even to the wrongdoer. The way God promises not to remember our sins anymore, though He surely never suffers from amnesia. You hear it, beloved? Forgiveness looking outwards to rebuke and repentance leads to restored relationships. If she repents, if he repents, forgive. And relationships, our relationships ever really restored where there is no repentance. There is a danger to watch out for there too, though, isn't there? Repentance can become a stick, a threat, a way scale, as it were. Have they repented enough? Is their repentance genuine? Have they shown themselves sufficiently sorry? But what have we done then? Aren't we in danger of taking the place of God? So Joseph even suggested to his brothers in the wonderful story of their reconciled relationship. Genesis 50 verse 19, as I pointed out, Do not fear, Joseph said to his brothers, his worried brothers, for am I in the place of God? 
It's as though he's saying, the only way I could stay mad at you is if I considered myself worthy to be your judge. But I am not. Now, Jesus' teaching keeps going in Luke 17 as well, and it tells us to be careful, doesn't it? If he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Seven times. That's not literal. Seven is the number of fullness. But how is that for us? By the third time, and maybe that's even being gracious, by the third time at least, we're probably ready to say, yeah, right. Now you're going to have to prove it. How am I supposed to believe you? And it is a hard teaching. But notice Jesus' words. He says, he turns to you seven times. This is no forcing out an apology. The brother or sister takes the initiative, turns and repents. Jesus says, forgive him. Forgive him again and again and again. Forgive him. Because you have this joy in your heart that God is sovereign even over this. Isn't that what we learn from Joseph? Joseph. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. There's no beating around the bush by Joseph. What you did was evil, he says. But despite your evil, God was doing good. Can you imagine Joseph after all he endured at their hands? But by God's grace for us even richer in Christ, we can look at the one who has wronged us, even in very evil ways, to say, you can't ultimately harm me. You can't take me out from under God's love and care. And I'm not trying to diminish in any way how hard that can be. The wrongs people experience at the hands of others, horrid sometimes. God's grace and love are always more. His mercy is is more. From there, Joseph is able to repay their evil even with good. He says, I'm going to care for your families. Give them the best they have. Oh, it doesn't mean that the memory of what happened to him at their hands was entirely wiped away. Maybe it lingered with him. Maybe he had flare-ups of anger as he had flashbacks of pain. But he stuffed them away because he'd sooner treat them the way God had treated him. Good for Joseph, right? He's a better man than I am. No. Because we are far richer people than he is. You and I, we know Jesus. We know even more to what lengths God went to secure forgiveness and reconciliation. Oh, the disciples too said to Jesus after hearing this hard teaching, they said, increase our faith. And we too, Lord, increase our faith. Then in answer, after looking inward and looking outward, he also teaches us to look upward. Our third point. What does Jesus say to his disciples? If you had faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What does he mean? If you understand the gospel even just a little, if you understand at all what God the Father is about to do for you in me, you can do great things. And we're even better placed than those apostles. We're not listening to Jesus before his death. But after, after his death and his resurrection, when he put the all man stamp on all of his promises. Are you crying out for more faith to forgive? Hard as it is, Jesus says, you are forgiven. And forgiven ones forgive. That's my grace to you. As the catechism summarizes it, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us. Your grace. Don't think it's necessary for you to leave this place now to knuckle down a little harder and do this hard work of forgiveness. No, leave this place looking upward 
to Jesus Christ, once offered on the cross. Look up to Jesus Christ, now the resurrected and ascended one, sitting at the right hand of His Father on high. It's His overwhelming grace to us in His sacrifice on the cross that will prompt us, that will equip us, that will move us, that will change us to forgive one another and to pursue this reconciliation and restoration. That's the only way that we will build healthy relationships and a healthy community here at Living Light. Through God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. Forgiven and forgiving. So, are you forgiving your debtors? It's a hard teaching. But that's why we come here to church again and again, and again. To hear the gospel preached, the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See, from His hands, His head, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen.
As we come to God in congregational and thanksgiving prayer once more, we come to God also with grief in our hearts over the passing away of a loved one. Yesterday, the grandfather of Rachel Viss, Wes and Rachel Viss, passed away, Bill Smouter, in Ancaster. After a long illness, yet God has sought to remove a family member that comes with grief. Pray that God would also sustain them as they prepare for a funeral this week. Let us come to our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us, wretched sinners, any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us. As we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. Father, it's hard for us in some ways to pray this petition. And yet in a profound way, you have also made it again so easy. When you point us to the wonder of the cross and how rich is your grace and the forgiveness of all our sins. Father, we pray, use your word as we have heard that this morning to help us grow, to grow increasingly in our relationships, that they might be healthy relationships, where we forgive one another as you have forgiven us, where we enjoy such reconciliation and restored relationships. It's hard because of our sin, but in the washing away of our sins, be gracious to us and do this work in us. May that also continue to, to see us grow as a community of believers. We thank you for the evidence of your grace among us already. There is a, a vibrancy that we enjoy, a life. Father, we thank you for that, that enthusiasm, that desire to grow together. We have sought that out as well in, in preparing to run through a course together. But how people change. We pray for your blessing over those efforts as well as Men and women have come forward expressing an interest in, in being trained to train the rest of us. May it please you to allow preparations for that to fall into place quickly, that we may grow also in that way. We thank you for the various teams and committees in congregational life where brothers and sisters are giving eagerly of their time and their talents to ensure that life continues to go on in a fruitful way here in this body of believers. We pray for their efforts. They may also bring praise to you. We pray for the continued love and care that we express to each other in so many different ways, in, in practical ways, in prayerful ways. In any community, there's always a lot that lives upon our hearts and in our activities. And so, Father, also again today, we, we pray with sorrow for a family that has lost a loved one. We thank you for the comfort that they also have, that the words of Jesus to the criminal are words to, to this brother. Today you are with me in paradise, and he has heard those words and is, is there with Christ. We thank you for relieving him of the suffering that he endured. This was not ex unexpected to them, and yet as they prepare, give them an extra measure of strength. We thank you also with the Dieleman family and the Hoches family that this past week, they were able to draw comfort and strength from a community that rallied around them in overwhelming numbers at times. And through the word especially that was open to them. Be near to them as they now move forward into a new way of life with that empty place. We pray for those who have been under the care of doctors. We think of our sister Jane North this past week, still in hospital, longing to go home. And will you allow that to come quickly? Give her patience. Give her rest under the awareness of the fact that you are her God. 
a place of refuge. We thank you that our sister Betty Jansen was also able to return the day after her procedure and that she continues to recuperate at home where she can find some rest and may it please you there too to bring complete healing. We thank you for our brother and sister Albert and Grace Bolcher that they can anticipate celebrating their anniversary later this week, 60 years together under your care. That you have sustained them in the vows that they have made so many years ago. As they celebrate with us as congregation today and, and later in this week again, will you be pre, pl- praised by those celebrations? We lay also before you the Feenstra family. You have, in your providence, put much on their path with the health of Joshua and now again with the hail that has so impacted their crops, which they've been working so hard to, to nurture through the course of the season. In the past, you have shown yourself faithful, and and we hold you to that faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Manifest that to them also this time around. Father, in so many ways, we are again and again confronted with how groaning this world, how much this world groans. It makes us long for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds. Hasten His coming. Until He comes, give us faithfulness to serve you in this world. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have an opportunity to express gratitude to our God in the offering, which this morning is for the Anchor Association. Those of you who may be unfamiliar with Anchor, it is an association which is run for the sake of those brothers and sisters in our midst who have special needs, uh, beautiful homes where our brothers and sisters are lived and loved and cared for. Uh, That also came to the fore this past week with the passing away of Jack Dieleman and has been laid on our hearts again how special that work is. And so that offering is also entrusted to your generosity, your cheerful giving as the Apostle Paul instructs us. Afterwards, we'll sing together from Psalm 130, Psalm 130, the stanzas 3 and 4.
Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive His blessing, and then go your ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.